Peter ends this, this theme here, uh, this discussion about false teachers and false prophets, men that will manipulate the word of God to take advantage of other people. And, and as he's finishing here, he really gives us a, really a descriptive image of these men in their hearts. So descriptive, it's, it's a little nauseous at times especially at the end of the chapter there when he talks about a dog returning to his own vomit that's pretty descriptive i mean you get the point and what he's saying when we get there and so in light of what he's saying there and i don't mean to offend anybody but i just was thinking about this i I thought about those things that make us nauseous at times but i don't know if you've ever noticed that there's this mental disgust that happens in your mind when you're about ready to take your hand because an item has fallen into a toilet, you know, and, and you go to, and you kind of hesitate, you know, you go, I don't want to stick my hand in a toilet, you know, I do, you know, I just kind of like, oh, and so you're hoping that you can go so fast that you don't get wet, you grab it and you're, you're out, you know, and water splatters all over the place. Usually what I do is go, Virginia! You know, my phone fell in the toilet, can you grab it? You know? And then she's so smart, she just gets the brush and pulls it right out. <laughs> but isn't there that, that natural disgust? You know, there's just something about putting your hand in a, in a toilet. I believe that's true of sin. I think that there is a natural disgust with sin. We just know that what we're doing or how we're living is not right. We're not, it, it's just not right. There's a disgust there in our spirits, in our minds. We understand that. And, it, and it's scriptural. Romans 2.15 says, who shows the work of the law written in their hearts? That is, the Holy Spirit has written in our hearts the law of God. We know the Ten Commandments without knowing the Ten Commandments. We know that to harm someone is wrong. That's simple. Something simple like that. We know it's wrong. Something in us, he says, their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Now that word conscience is interesting in the Greek. It's two words, con, shence. The word con means with. Shence means science. With science. Science means knowledge. Understanding things through knowledge. So what he's saying there, with knowledge the spirit's bearing witness and so there is this knowledge that god has given to man to women that it is very natural that we know what we're doing is wrong it's like a a person committing adultery they know they're wrong in their own spirit because god has put that there naturally and they know that if god were to appear that they would be judged rightly before god himself And so there's something natural about that. Now, these men understand what they're doing. And we saw last week in verses 12 through 17, they're natural brute beasts. They're like animals. They're only after their own appetites, what they desire, what they want, the self-centeredness. We know that there's spots, there are blemishes within the church. They get into the church and they use the church for their own selfish means. Their eyes are full of adultery and we really defined that last week in the sense that all they can think about is adulterous acts, fornication and sexual immorality. It's embedded in their hearts. It's their actual nature like animals. They entice uh, unstable souls or young believers They take advantage of people that don't have the knowledge or understanding. And so they use that against them and take advantage of them. And Peter ends in verse 17 saying that that reserved for them is the blackness and darkness forever. God will judge them one day. He is a righteous God. And believe me, all of us will stand before God in judgment. And he will judge us rightly because he knows our very heart. You may fool us. You may fool others, but you won't fool God, and God judges rightly. And so we come to the few verses here to end this chapter. Next week, we'll get into the end times and what Peter describes as as an interesting time that will take place, and I love talking about the end times, so we may go a little bit slower as we see the Lord's uh, not slack concerning his promises and coming back, but he loves us enough that he's hoping that souls will get saved. You know, there are souls in this church right now that need to be saved because they're into religion and not relationship. They have an idea of who God is, but it's the wrong idea. And God wants your heart. 
and not your acts and so forth. So we'll talk about that next week, but this week we're going to look at professing Christians. And when I say professing Christians, what I mean by that is they profess to know God, but their hearts are really far from God. They don't have a heart for God. And so let's look at these two verses here, 18 and 19, uh, the fragrance of false teachers. He says in verse 18, for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure those or they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in errors. So he says here that these men, when they speak, they speak great swelling words. But the words are really empty words. There's no foundation. There's no, there's no promise. There's no power behind it. They're just great words. They're great words that they use to manipulate people to get something from them. In fact, the Greek, the present tense, indicates that it is a continual practice. This is how they live. They live with these great words that that, um, they speak to manipulate people. It's a way of life. It's a way of expressing, to draw attention to themselves, to get something. You know, it's their passion um, in that uh, orator position that they have to impress people literally it means inflated words that say nothing don't be impressed because men speak uh, with great religious words now let me qualify this though because I have to say that there are pastors and teachers that, that teach the word of God and are really great at it you know they're great orators they're great storytellers and there's nothing wrong with that it's not something that they they depend upon, though. They depend on the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit and not necessarily on their great teaching, but their great teachers. But then there are those who are just motivational speakers. Some have even suggested, by the way, that some of these speakers that you see on TV that are, are manipulating people to give their money have actually studied uh, hypnotism, hypnotizing people. There's a certain way to hypnotize people to get them to do things. And so the way that they speak, they they speak in such a way that that they're getting people to focus and then they're suggesting and then they're then asking and then all of a sudden people are just giving because they're hypnotized into giving. That's been an observation by people that have studied hypnotizing and and all those science that goes behind it. They, They notice that these men have the same techniques and so they know what they're doing. And they do it purposely. Uh, The great theologian Paul himself uh, did not preach uh, to impress, but just to express the truth of God. He didn't care about impressing people. You know, he just wanted to make sure that people understood the word and that they applied the word to their lives and they saw the fruit in their lives and not necessarily to impress them. You know, with his clothes, with his words. In fact, he said he was a, a, a less a speaker than Apollo, who was probably more, more flowery and affluent in speaking. And yet Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Uh, he knew the difference between communication and manipulation. And there's a big difference between the two. You can communicate some truth, but then you can also manipulate. And we don't want to manipulate. We don't want to manipulate people into doing anything. We want people to do it from their hearts and because they love Jesus. And and believe me, if somebody knows Jesus, really knows him, and is appreciative of what he has done for them by dying on the cross, taking their place, and giving them eternal life, they really understand it. They're appreciative, and they they do want to serve the Lord. Uh, When I first got saved, I mean, I was a wretch. I could tell you stories that blow your mind of what I used to do. I was a scum of the earth. And then Jesus came into my life. And he literally saved me out of that. And it was like, well, he would save me? I wouldn't save me. I know what I am. And yet you saved me? And so when I went to church and they, they asked if anyone was interested in just cleaning up before a service, I was like, I can do that. You know, so I got there and cleaning toilets and I was on my hands and knees cleaning around the toilet bowl and, and all of that. I was doing it for the Lord because I just was so appreciative of what he had done for me. And we have people in the church that that understand that. And that's why they serve the way they serve. That's why they served at that funeral. That's why they go to the Harvest Fest and they go out there and they serve because they just love Jesus. And there are people that don't understand that. It's because their faith in Christ is not based upon relationship. It's based upon religion. 
and on what they can get from God and not necessarily what they can give to God. See, we don't want to manipulate, though, anyone. And, and that's not a manipulation that gets you to feel guilty uh, about you not serving. That's between you and the Lord. You know, it has to come from your heart. And if I were to manipulate you and, and then you do it, first thing, you won't last because you'll be serving, complaining, and murmuring while you're serving, and that's the flesh. And so you won't last. And so really it's not benefiting you or the Lord. And so when you do things, you want to do it from the heart. Don't let anyone manipulate you into doing anything here. And we're not to do that. We're to somehow encourage you to express the truth, to to tell you what a blessing it is to serve. I get so blessed by serving. I was so blessed sitting there watching the whole funeral service, everyone served. I was so blessed. So I stood there the whole time. We cleaned up afterwards, and I was just blessed. I couldn't wait for the next opportunity uh, for God to use us in that way. It was just a blessing. There's joy. There's rest. There's peace. There's just something there that, that, that you just know that you're pleasing God when you're serving him in that way. This is what Paul said in Ephesians 4.14. We should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. I mean, that's pretty descriptive, right? The trickery of men, the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And that's what men do. Shouldn't do that. I've seen pastors who manipulate to get people to do things. It's not the right thing to do, and a good pastor would never do that to anyone else. We we hope to encourage you uh, to do things from the heart. I was watching a video of a young Hispanic man, and it was one of these Channel 40 used to be, I don't know what it is, 14 now, TBN. Uh, ministry, and, and there's some good people on there. I know Greg Glory goes on there and other good Bible teachers, but there's also a garbage on there. You get a lot of these men that are false teachers on there. And I was listening to this one young Hispanic guy, and he was like exactly like uh, Peter's describing here. He had these great swelling words, you know, and he yelled a lot uh, so that he could be heard. I think that's part of the hypnotist thing because people are like, you know, really paying attention. And he was talking about, and he, of course, he's trying to get something from them, and that was money, he's plant seeds of money into his ministry, and you'll be blessed type of thing. But he was talking about, he, he shared this story how God used him in a great way. He said he was invited to speak at an event. He goes, and it was a secular event. Not a religious event, not a Christian event. It was secular so he kept focusing on that. So people were like, wow, like this is a big deal that, that he would get invited to something that nobody really wants a religious man to go to. And then he said, and it was huge. I'm not talking thousands. I'm talking hundreds of thousands. Great swelling words. Hundreds of, that's a lot of people. Billy Graham, I don't think he has even had 100,000 people. But he's talking hundreds of thousands of people are here. And they ask me, oh, poor little me to go up there and, and pray. And so he said, so I said, okay, because I saw God in that, you know, he's like, God in that thing, you know, and God was going to do a great work. And so he goes on with the story, he says he got there, and they stopped him and says, oh, change of plans. And he thought, oh, okay, God isn't going to be glorified. He says, no, we get asked two other people to pray too. We want to be politically correct, you know, we want to make sure everyone is covered. So we, we asked a spiritualist and a Muslim to come, and, and we, of course, we asked you first, so if you want to go first, and he thought, and it, just to let the people know how smart he was. And I thought, no, let God have the last word before these guys, you know? And he kept focusing on that. And so he said, spiritualist goes up there and the, they pray, Father, Mother God, trees, gods, and God that's everywhere, we just praise you and we thank you for bringing us all here together in unity as, as your children, you know, and so forth. And then the Muslim gets up there and says, Allah, and you know, says a few words. And he said, I'm trembling. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm like just wondering how many. And God just said to me, spoke to me so clear. I heard his voice. Just say, be yourself. Just be yourself. So I was going to be myself. And so I got up there. And I started shaking. And the Lord just said, out of Acts, to the God above all gods. You know, and everybody just like, ah, just clapping, you know, because he's like a profound statement, you know. And that's how these men are. They just, they throw stories out there that are just so huge, so grander that you go, is that even real? (laughs) You know, I mean, could that be true? Hundreds of thousands of people. And of course he rakes in 
all of the money. Nothing wrong with stories, you know, but, but there's, a, there's a certain limit to those stories. These men tell these stories all day long. I told you about the guy years ago who, who was on TBN, and it seemed like every Sunday he was on there about suits. Every Sunday, the same story. It was suits. God wanted me to have a suit. And so he said, he was just walking along, a friend calls him and says, hey, just Lord, just lay this on my heart, buy you a suit. Wow, praise God. And then he said, then I was somewhere in a plane and some guy sitting next to me just said, hey, you need a suit. You know, and the whole time was about suits, suits, suits. And one guy gave him a whole wardrobe of suits. And then at the end it was like, God can give you a suit. Just plant some seed money into my ministry and he'll get you a suit too. It's crazy stuff. Peter says they allure you through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped or run away or sought safety. You know, there are young believers who come to the Lord innocently and desiring to know Him. And these men take advantage of them through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness. They know how men tick. They know what they're really hungering for in the flesh. And they use that to their advantage. You know that a person that doesn't have money, that lacks money and resources to provide for themselves, that, that when someone comes along and says, how'd you like to be rich? They're like, yeah, I'd love to do that. Follow me, I'll show you how. See, they know how to entice them and lure them in. Yeah. There was a, a church years ago, it's called the Church uh, Children of God, Children of God, and it was just after the hippie movement, uh, and this church was just growing and what they did was they knew men. men. Men are sexual men. God created them to be sexual. They're, these are things that are in their thoughts. They're to procreate. They're to bring godly children into the earth and fill the earth and so forth. And there's just that tendency for men to be sexual. Well, this church, this children of God knew that. They understood that. And so the leaders, what they did was they found the most beautiful young girls and they made them into evangelists. And they sent them out to the streets to evangelize. And so these girls then would be going out to the streets and they would find young men and they would start the touching and the feeling and you need to come to church and God loves you and, and they enticed them through the sensuality and that's how their church was growing. That's manipulation. That's wrong. That's what these men do. They entice you to these things. You know? And we're all enticed in various ways. You know, Some of us might be enticed as children. My mom promised to give me an allowance if I go to church. You know, if I go to church, it's because, you know, I can get this or get that. That's not God. That isn't God. That's your own flesh. Why do we go to church? To worship God, to express our love towards Him, to be equipped so that we can better serve Him in our lives in this world. That's why we go to church. No other reason. We don't go to church to even give money so that we get money back. We give because we love God and we want to support his work, which is going out there to reach the community. Uh, this church doesn't use that money for itself. It uses it to reach this community. We're here for the community. But these men entice you. They, they set the bait. They know you love money, and so they'll hook you in with money. And if you plant a seed in my ministry, God will bless you, and you will get even more money. And so Peter encourages these new believers to escape from those who live in air and they're living in that way in other words they're living in luxury and nice houses big big homes and big pools and jets and cars and nice medallions and best suits you know driving around the nicest cars and that's their lifestyle but it's an air it's not what god wants for us that's important that you see that in a minister there is a conviction i shared with you earlier that we know when something's not right I remember I went up to, uh, uh, actually, to meet, meet this guy for lunch, and he was a missionary out to Israel, and we were thinking of supporting him, and so I wanted to get some more information, so I went to lunch with him. He drives up in a Mercedes. You know the first thing that came out of his mouth was, um, I just want to talk, tell you about the Mercedes. That's the first thing that came out of his mouth. Why? Because he knew something was wrong. And he said, I just, I got such a good deal I mean, the guy that owned it before me was a friend. He practically gave it to me for free. Okay, I mean, it's a good car. It'll last you. I mean, that was all the reasons. But what it represents is something different, doesn't it? And we know that. And, and that's what he was guilty of is what it represents, being careful. See, that's what I love about Chuck Smith. You know, he never owned a new car. 
just for that reason. He always bought a, a used car. Always bought a used car. And so he made sure, I remember one time at a pastor's conference, don't let anyone know I told you this. <laughs> but at a pastor's conference, he got up there and he was saying, he just kind of touching the table like this. And he was, you know, there's a couple of pastors here who are driving cars that they shouldn't be driving. They're, they're BMWs and Lexuses. <laughs> and then he named them. <laughs> I'm not going to name them because you'll know them. You know, but it's so true, you know, what they represent. You know, and so that's something that sticks with me. And so I have a PT Cruiser because I don't want him. You know, he'll never say, there's somebody driving a PT Cruiser. <laughs> we need to be careful. We, we need to see. Uh, what these men really are representing, where their hearts really are. Verse 19 says, While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. So they're slaves themselves, and yet they're promising you liberty. That doesn't make sense. I think of what uh, Jesus said about the religious leaders. Here they go proselyte people to come into their religion, but they make them worse than themselves. They're just becoming slaves to their own religion. But these men are slaves to their money, slaves to their lust, slaves to their moral, immoral acts and so forth that end up leading to decay. And yet they're out there promising you liberty. What they're really promising is enslaveness to them. Is that a word, enslaveness? Slavery to themselves. They become their slaves. And that's really what happens because you, you want to be rich? Follow me. And so now you're following a man in being rich and not God. And now you're their slave. And so he's saying, hey, just keep, keep it up. God's going to bless you. So I'd like you to go around and start handing out envelopes, getting money from everyone else. You'll, you'll see God's going God's to bless you. you know, oh, I want you to start calling them on the phone and seeing if they can donate some more. Don't, don't worry. God's going to bless you. You're just their slave. And you're making them richer and richer is what he's saying. And like Peter said in chapter 2, verse 20, the latter end is worse than, than the beginning for them because they're... So focus on the love of money, which is the root of all evil. It's interesting, Matthew Henry said this, grace does not run in the blood, but corruption does. Corruption does. Now, he's not talking about literally the blood flow in our veins. We know uh, that nothing runs in there but red blood cells, white blood cells, and those things that cleanses our, our body and keeps us functioning. What he's saying is spiritually, you know, grace doesn't run naturally in our blood. It's not part of us. But what is is corruption. You leave us to ourselves and we're going to corrupt. We're going to manipulate. We're going to do things that are wrong because by nature itself, we're sinners, the Bible says. We all come from the seed of Adam, uh, which we have a tendency of sinning. And so sinners can beget sinners, right? Easy. And so that's what these men do. They beget other sinners. They come to them in slaves. But yet saints cannot beget saints. I can't beget you. That's only a... uh, something that is done through the Holy Spirit and and it's God's work in your life as you call out to God. And so he goes on and says, for by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. So again, he makes him a slave. Now verse 20 through 21, um, there is a danger that comes with following these people. And there's a danger of falling away. During the movement of... um, <clears throat> of the wealth doctrine, of the wealth doctrine. Yeah, if I can get some water. I thought they had water up here. <clears throat> of the wealth doctrine. I saw a lot of people tithing and giving to these wealth doctrines in hopes of getting back. That was their whole motive. And when all of that was exposed, this was in the 80s or so, when all of it was exposed, and it was by secular media that they started to get exposed. When they saw letters <clears throat> that had poured into these ministries, you know, because they would say, write your letter in, write, put a check in there, a seat of faith, we'll pray for you, God will heal you. And these were old ladies, these were people that had chronic illnesses and they were just putting in, in, in uh, checks and money and cash. They found those letters in a dumpster. Letters were never opened, the checks and money were pulled out. And they were in the dumpster thing. They were all in the dumpster there. And so this was exposed. And so these people were in big trouble because then the IRS got involved and what are they doing and so forth. When all this was exposed, those that that were followers all of a sudden started falling away because now they saw this was all a scam. And they started blaming God. 
instead of looking into it and instead of being responsible, making good decisions, listening to good pastors that are warning them, because I can remember some of them saying, that guy's just judgmental. That pastor's judgmental. He is, he's judging uh, his brother in Christ who's trying to help out the body of Christ. In reality, they were fleecing the body of Christ. And they fell away because they blamed God. Well, why would God allow me to get into something like that? Well, God's giving you a free will. And you can read for yourself what Peter is saying here. You know, so we need to be careful because there's a tendency, a danger of us falling away if we follow men. If you follow a man, you will fall. If you follow God, he'll always sustain you. <clears throat> Verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollution or the filthiness, the contamination of this world system, of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what he's talking about there is that um, they came to Christ, they've escaped the old life, the old system, through Jesus Christ, an understanding and knowledge of God, but yet it wasn't really a relationship, it was a religion, is what was Peter referring to here. We have an example of that in Acts chapter 8 where Simon, he had been um, a convert to Christianity, but he wasn't filled yet with the Holy Spirit. He did not have the Holy Spirit, nor was he born again. And he happened to see the apostles laying hands on one another, and the Holy Spirit was being distributed as the Lord saw fit, and people were being converted through signs and wonders and and great moves, just a move of the Spirit going. And he saw that and he thought, wow, if I could have that, imagine what my ministry could look like. And so he went to the apostles and said, hey, how much would you charge, (laughs) you know, me so that I could have the Holy Spirit like you have so that my ministry can grow? And so, I mean, you know who Benny Hinn is. He's on TBN. He's got that nice little flair in his in his hair. <clears throat> Very charismatic, and he somehow was. He's one of the guys that they they suggest may know how to hypnotize people. He's one of the guys that has control of the Holy Spirit, and, and he's been known to take the Holy Spirit and he'll literally like a baseball grab it, just that the audience throw it and the whole audience just falls over. Literally, they fall over through suggestion. He bought it. He purchased it. He learned it from his mentor and how to do this, you know, in their, in their school of ministry and so forth. And that's what Simon Peter, or I'm sorry, not Simon Peter, but Simon wanted. He wanted the same power, so he wanted to purchase it. And this is what Peter said, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You can't purchase God's gifts with money. It is a gift, from God to you. He has given to each one of us a gift to use for his glory. And it's as he sees fit to distribute it to each person and individuals. You can't buy it. You can't own it. You know, it is something God gives to you. If you buy it, own it, work for it, pay whatever it is, uh, put it on your credit card, you know, it's religion. It is religion. Many of us are into religion. I know that I was into religion. I was basing my relationship with God based upon what I was doing. That's religion. See, if I serve more, that means I love God more. See, that's religion. Instead of serving God just because he's God, that's relationship. Religion is where you come in late to church because you're not excited about being here in church for the Lord, to worship him and praise him. You know, early on when I got saved, man, I would not miss church at all. If the doors were open, I was there. We're living in a different age. The spirit has been quenched, and so people don't understand that. And so when I say that, it's almost like, oh, you're being judgmental. No, I'm not. It's just a different age that we're living at. Uh, During the hippie movement and the moving of the Holy Spirit, man, that Holy Spirit was moving, changing lives drastically, you know, converting them overnight, 160 degrees turn or 80 degree turn in their lives. But now it's almost like we think the Holy Spirit's there for us and we will tell and direct him what to do. You know. See, religion says I'll be there whenever I get there you know, because it's based upon what I think, not what God requires. You know. So 
the way that I can describe this is this relationship with God is kind of similar to our relationship with someone that we fall in love with. You remember falling in love with someone? Remember that first time? Uh, you didn't, okay, forget about what you know about them now. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that first time that you fell in love, come on, you know, you got the goosebumps, you know, you wanted to be around them all the time, you couldn't stop thinking about them. You know, when, when I was in the, uh, just started high school, <clears throat> we used to take the bus to school, my bus route was, was to the richer area where Virginia lived. And so I would take it to where she lived, and then she'd get on the bus, and we'd sit together and go to school. That was our routine in the morning. Well, when that stopped, when they stopped busing me to her area and just straight to school, then I got up earlier and walked to her bus stop so that I could go sit with her and go to school. That's a relationship. I would walk. That's what I would do for her. Not because I, I wanted her to love me. It's because I loved her and I wanted to be with her. That's why I walked. And then we would go to school, and we were in the same classes and, you know, uh, hung around at recess and then lunch and then recess. And in between classes, you got four minutes, and we were running to get to class because we just wanted to hang around each other. We were in love with each other, you know. One teacher, uh, African-American teacher, I'm trying to remember his name as I'm speaking, but he was a, a math teacher, and he would see us in the corner, you know, and of course we're hugging and smooching because we're teenagers, you know, and he'd come up and go, bunch of lovebirds, you know, type of thing, you know. I don't know if I should be sharing that. <laughs> this is in high school. Don't do this, high school kids. It's not Christian. But I just, we loved each other. She'd stay after you know, she loved me just as much. She stayed after I was in track or cross country. She stay after. She'd be in the bleachers cheering me on. And of course, I'm running like, yeah, <laughs> doing that as fast as I can. But I loved her so much, I stopped practicing, stopped working hard. And so I, going from, you know, the top five, I went to like the top 10 <laughs> because I wanted to spend more time with her. I gave up things that I loved, you know, for her. We'd go home from school and we'd take the long route because now she's staying. We miss the buses. So we'd go to Taco Bell on the corner of Kalima there in Otterman and we'd have our tacos and our drinks and we'd walk all the... We'd get home at 7 o'clock. You know, forget homework. Who cares about homework? What do I need homework for? I'll blame the system later on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was in love. <clears throat> you know, stupid love then. <laughs> But that's the type of love that God wants to have with us, that relationship, where we just want to spend time with him. And I know that because I, I did that. I read through his word. I wanted to know who he was. I went to church every day. I wanted to understand you know, what it was to be a Christian and, and be a good Christian. I wanted to please him. Uh, you know, Whatever it was, Lord, I'm here because I love you, because I know you love me. And it's just based upon that, nothing else, nothing else. He accepts you just the way you are. You have to understand that. He wants you to change, but he still loves you just the way you are. That's what a relationship is. Religion says, if you don't change, guess what? I'm giving you up. I'm leaving you. That's religion. God won't ever leave you. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Work through it. We'll work through it together. I'll help you through your problems. I'll help you through your struggles. We'll work on it because that's what a, re a relationship does. And so we need to look for a relationship. Otherwise, we get entangled. Look at what he says in the next statement. They are again entangled in them and overcome. Entangled in that old life, that sin, because it's religion and it doesn't last long and you go back to your old life because you know it doesn't work. And you get entangled. Interesting word, this entangled. I looked it up and in the Greek it means to braid or twist. You know how the little girls can get, get together and they get their long hair, put them in their fingers and tr just, sh they got a braid like that. I tried it. It was a mess. It was a black widow's nest, you know, type of thing. They used the word for Jesus when the Roman soldiers would take uh, thorns and they would braid it together and they would make a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. That's what the word entangled means. They entangled that braid and they put it upon Jesus' head. One lexicon has a picturesque definition stating that it means to be involuntarily interlaced to the point of immobility and was used literally of sheep whose wool is caught in thorns. So you get the idea that this 
this animal who's caught in thorns, and you, you ever touch sheep's wool, it gets, it's just really sticky, sticky finger, and you can almost, you know, kind of not pull your finger out, and they get in thorns, and they can't get out. They become immobile, and now they're just sitting there, and you got to literally go over there and cut everything and pull it out of their, their hair because it gets matted up, and they're entangled, and they have no control, and it's not of their will. They made bad decisions by going down there, and now they're entangled in it. Listen to this. <clears throat> if you're not listening, you're asleep. Jesus was entangled in the crucifixion. Not of his will, but of the Father's will. He was entangled in the beatings, the crowns of thorns, the mockery, the nails to his hands, his feet. He was entangled in it. And yet... It was his choice to be braided to the cross. Wow. That's love. (laughs) That is love. He understood the entanglement of it all, and he freely said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And I willfully go and braid myself to that cross so that we could have eternal life. (laughs) For someone to disregard the work of Jesus Christ is callousness. They have no heart. They don't see what Jesus has really done for us. And yet there are those atheists and those people that will say, Jesus, right? What a knucklehead. Yeah. And they use other descriptive words because they don't understand what God has really done for them and entangling him to that crucifixion of his own free will. But these men, they'll, they'll entangle you to take advantage of you. And, and Peter says the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Yeah. Greater judgment will come upon them. He goes on in verse 21. If you'll read with me, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. Do you know you're accountable right now? Those of you who have come to this church and have heard the gospel message, you're ha- accountable now. It would have been better for you if not to heard the gospel and to go away and then stand before God. But because now you've heard the gospel, you understand the gospel, now you're accountable to the gospel. Greater revelation has a greater accountability. You need to humble yourselves. In a minute, I'm going to ask that you make a choice for Christ and not for this world. Because your way isn't working. It's only chaotic and cruel. You know, it's bringing disaster and destruction to your homes and to your own life. And God wants to free you from that and not enslave you to that. He goes on and says, not only is it good that you, it would have been better if you not hear it than having known it and turn from the holy commandments and be delivered to them. But as it has been, or as it has happened to them according to the true proverb, now he talks about a proverb here, a byword, a little short saying that illustrates a great principle that Peter gives us here. This is very descriptive. And he's quoting from the Old Testament in, in Proverbs 26, 11. He says, a dog returns to its own vomit. That's descriptive. That's gross you know, to even see. How many of you have seen that? It's pretty gross. And they just go up there and lap it up like crazy, you know? And it's not talking about sniffing. You know, he doesn't just go over there and sniff. No, he just laps it right up, you know? I mean, it's a picture of a dog lapping up a bunch of garbage, this un regurgitated food that just vomits out of his mouth. And he says, oh, I'm a little hungry, goes back to that. And that's what he's talking about with these men. They go back to their sinful life. They go back to the thing that's destroying them. They go back to that thing that will bring judgment upon them and they lap it up without any sense or understanding of what they're really doing. Peter gives another proverb. A sow, or a sow, having washed to her willowing in the mire. Now, this proverb here, I could not find in Scripture. I looked up the word sow, S-O-W, and the only place that it's used is concerning sowing seeds into the ground, but never for a hog or a pig wallowing in mire. So what Peter is doing, he's taking a true principle that takes place in nature, and that is that you look at a hog, it, it likes to go to the mud and take a bath. And that's a principle that he uses concerning these individuals, that they're like these, these pigs who you can clean them up, but what do they do? They go right back to the mud. 
Robinson gives a story in ancient uh, literature that say that the rich would take their hogs to the bathhouses. And they would give them baths in these houses. Uh, interesting how these bathhouses were used. Uh, when you go to Israel, they, they kind of break up these, these Roman provinces uh, in different areas, and they show you how things were done. They actually had drainage systems throughout the city that they ran down the middle of the roads. They dug ditches and encased them with some sort of cement, and then water, water would flow to them, and then they would just go out of the city, so it kept the city from flooding. And they had these bathhouses that were built upon these little pillars that were so big and were round and they had gaps that they would put uh, hot steaming waters in, you know, and it brings steam into the, uh, into the room and they'd have water flowing in. And so they'd bring the pigs in there and they'd wash them all up with themselves and, and everything else. And it says that they would go out of the bathhouse and the pig would immediately see a muddy hole and it'd go right to it and all around in it. <laughs> Wilbur, our pig, Virginia has a pig named Wilbur. It was supposed to be a little miniature. It was like this big when we got it. Now it's this big. And it's this round. And he loves to be scratched on his tummy. You start scratching his tummy and he goes, oh, right there. And I'll grab his arm and I'll scratch him under there because he can't get there. Poor little guy. And under here, you know, and he can't get there. And so he just like, oh, you know, just loves it. Virginia went out to uh, Target to buy him a pool because it's been hot, and we can't put him in the pool, otherwise he'd be like a, you know, one of those hippos in the bottom of the pool. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so she bought him a little wading pool, you know, two feet or one foot, and she's been trying to get him to go into that pool, and he won't do it. He starts feeling the plastic on the edge, and he just backs off. Well, it got hot, I guess, just the other day. She came home, and she found him in the pool, and there he is laying in the pool. You know, and of course he's trying to get out because as soon as Mama comes home and she, and Wilbur hears her voice, he jumps up because you know food, you know, and so he comes running. So he's in the water and he's like this, and he's got to position himself right because his head goes in the water and he's breathing water and and so forth. But he gets out of it and he's so clean. He actually looks clean. Usually he's dirty like a pig. First thing he does is he goes and starts rolling in the mud, right away. He, he dug this hole in our grass, my grass. He dug a hole, and it's all muddy now, and he just goes and starts rolling in it, you know. And then he goes running to Virginia. I'm ready for you now, you know. Why does he do that? Because it's natural. It's natural. See, the action of the dog, the action of the pig here reveals their true nature. That's their true nature. They're just animals. They're animals without moral values or laws. Warren Wisby said this, they are not God's sheep. They are pigs and dogs in sheep's clothing and eventually go back to their own natural habits. That's religion. I was a Catholic for 20-something years and I went to church almost every Sunday until 18. Then I stopped going. And I did all the sacraments, performed all the rituals, but I was a Catholic. I was a Catholic. I knew God. I didn't know God. I knew religion. See, because I was also then living my life. I was out partying. I was out taking drugs. I was out cheating on my wife. You know, I was all these things. That's religion. That's not relationship. You don't know God. You're just an animal going back to what you know naturally, and that is to fulfill your sinful nature. See, true sheep keep themselves clean for the Lord. They want to be holy before their God because they love God. Listen to what Jesus said. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Sheep know their master. When a shepherd calls to the sheep, the sheep come running because they know him, because they know that he loves them, and he's leading them to greener pastures or watching over them because there's wolves out there ready to devour them, and so they know and understand their Savior, and they come running. But those that are not, they're like, eh, I don't need to listen to him. Who does he think he is? I'll do my own thing. And next thing you know, they're on the barbie. Some wolf got some, eating them away. Or they're falling over a cliff. Or they can't eat because the, the, the grain and stuff is all gone because they ate it all, but they know better. No, God's sheep hear his voice. They come running because they know his word. Let me close. These men here that Peter is talking about, they're no longer mentally ashamed of what they're doing. I mean, they can easily just put their hands in the toilet 
without any problem whatsoever. We need to be careful that they don't drag us into the toilet. We need to be careful that we aren't led to destruction. That we understand that our Savior loves us and we have a relationship with Him and He would never do anything to harm us but to take care of us and bless us even in spite of us. When we will at times wander away and do dumb things, He still receives us back into His arms because that's the kind of love He has for us and we need to have for Him. No matter what, we know that He loves us. He cares about us, and we want a relationship with him. If you're not sure of your salvation, I'm going to ask you right now to raise your hand. Do you know you're going to heaven, or do you have religion? Do you see the difference between religion? It's your works. You think coming to church is going to get you into heaven? It's not. You think coming to church is going to give you favor in God's eyes? It's not. God, are, God already has done the work. For your eternal salvation. God is already having favor on you. You're breathing right now. That's religion. If you have religion, you need a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to give you that opportunity so I can ask the worship to come up. Let me be clear. Let me be clear so you understand that I'm not manipulating your heart, but it's something that you have to choose to do. It's your choice to follow Jesus. You have to make that willful choice to follow him, to accept his work on the cross and nothing else. You have to make that choice. But not only that choice, but you have to also choose to say, be my Lord, lead me and guide me, and I will follow you. Those are the choices you have to make. Not just say, come and save me and then go and live your life. That's religion. No, be my savior through your work. And now be my Lord. I will follow you because I know you have good things for me. I know you will not just leave me and forsake me. I know that you will bless my socks off. As Pastor Chuck would always say, bless my socks off, Lord. (laughs) Because God does that. He likes to bless his people.